This story actually has led the Utah Physicians for a Healthy Environment to launch our newest Clean the Air campaign, which you might consider Save Utah's Air, and this will probably get cut off at the bottom, Plant a Tree in the Body Orifice of Your Choice. <laughs> now, to help us launch this campaign, we solicited the help of the nation's foremost environmental scientist, Dr. Stephen Colbert. Unfortunately, Dr. Colbert said he didn't much care for the environment, and he recommended that if we wanted cleaner air in Utah, we'd better import it from China. <laughs> well, actually, China provides us with a good object lesson on the pollution consequences of unfettered industrialization. Some economists think that the cost of pollution in China is virtually the entirety of their GDP growth, i.e. 10% and that between a half a million and a million people in China die every year because of their air pollution. Now the Chinese people have started to rebel against this trend. On an average day, there are about 300 events of civil disobedience or outright rioting triggered by rapidly growing outrage over pollution. In one town of about 7,000 people, just one chemical factory, a factory that made some of the components of your flat screen TVs, had caused so much pollution that everyone in the town had to have all their food and water trucked somewhere else because it was all too toxic for them to consume. Virtually every child in the town had lead toxicity. Well, last year the townspeople had had enough. They stormed the factory and they shut it down and they painted these words on the walls of this factory. And I'm sorry you can't see all that. They said, give us back our green hills, our clean water, our fresh air. Give us justice. We want to live. This is a picture a little closer to home. It's about a year ago. The PM 2.5 on that day was about 95. And it's an example of the intense pollution that we get often along the Wasatch Front. As many of you know, the counties along the Wasatch Front have had on many days this last year the worst air pollution in the country. And we have exceeded the, uh, the daily average for PM 2.5 44 times already this year during, that, during the winter season. The American Lung Association gives us the ranking of F for the two most important criteria pollutants of PM 2.5 and ozone. The graffiti painted on that Chinese factory might often seem appropriate here in Utah. Give us back our green hills, our clean water, our fresh air. Give us justice. We want to live. Now, because of the systemic inflammation and uh, arterial inflammation that Dr. Pope talked about, virtually every organ in your body is affected by that process, especially the big three. Now, I, everybody may have their own favorite organs. Um, I won't argue about what your personal favorite organs are. I can tell you what my favorite organs are. My favorite organs are my heart, my lungs, and my brain. I consider my other organs kind of second string. Um, we're just beginning to learn what air pollution does to the brain, and that's what I'd like to talk about next. Mice exposed to air pollution that exists near the Los Angeles Coliseum demonstrate brain inflammation and cell injuries associated with the first stages of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Mouse embryos exposed in utero to low concentrations of diesel exhaust within 60 minutes started showing decreased spontaneous activity in the womb and increased levels of neurotransmitters, dopamine, and norepinephrine. In other words, they started demonstrating the stress response. Another group of mice exposed to air pollution were unable to distinguish between legitimate political commentary and a manipulative flimflam artist <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I told you I'd offend everybody by the end of this talk, so I've got at least a certain group here. Researchers funded by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences examined a group of dogs and a group of children in two groups. They took a group from Mexico City where the PM 2.5 is about twice what it is in Salt Lake City and then they took another group from other less polluted cities in Mexico. And what they found is that dogs playing poker in more air pollution lost more money than the I wanted to see if anybody was paying attention. <laughs> Some of you were paying attention, but not all of you were paying attention. They first examined the children, and they found that in cognitive tests, the children who lived with higher air pollution, i.e. in Mexico City, performed more poorly on intelligence tests, and on MRI scans, they found that the children from Mexico City, 57% of them, showed hyperintense white matter prefrontal lesions compared to only 8% of controls. These are the kinds of findings that you see in early Alzheimer's. These are in children. Now after euthanasia of the dogs, not the children, at autopsy the dogs from Mexico City showed inflammation of brain tissue and vascular lesions in their brains and had similar findings on MRI scans of their brains. This group of researchers did another study where they did autopsies on children and young adults who died suddenly of unrelated causes, usually trauma, in Mexico City again. And they found that when compared to children who grew up with less air pollution, children and young adults showed microscopic evidence of brain inflammation and nervous system degeneration, the same kind again that characterizes Alzheimer's and to a lesser extent Parkinson's disease. Now again, these are children. These are not adults. This is what Alzheimer's looks on gross examination. This study demonstrated that particulate matter directly reaches the brain tissue and activates an inflammatory process in the brain stem. So that if you're a typical teenage boy, this leaves you with a brain that looks like this. You may have to look at that one for a minute. <laughs> By the time you, actually I was thinking about that last night and I thought that this was a much better caption for that, <laughs> given all the news stories recently. By the time you are middle aged or older, this disorder progresses to the point where a lifetime of breathing air pollution and watching cable news shows results in this irreversible syndrome commonly found in chronic BYU football fans <laughs> called pathetic loser's disease. There you did it. Yeah, I, got, I got about 80% of you. Okay, good. My goal is to get 100% before I'm finished. <laughs> this same group uh, of researchers demonstrated that pollution actually causes a breakdown of the nasal mucosa the barrier which contributes then to brain inflammation by increasing the access of particulate matter to the brain through the olfactory and trigeminal nerve pathways. A process that completely bypasses the lungs as a portal system to get into your system. It goes directly to your brain by inhaling it through your nose. So that if you've got a nose like this, you are in some trouble. You're gonna have Alzheimer's sooner than uh, somebody whose nose is perhaps a little smaller. Actually, if you've got a nose that looks like this, you've got bigger problems than Alzheimer's, I would say. Monitoring of brain activity by EEG has demonstrated that diesel exhaust at levels commonly found in urban air, uh, urban air pollution environments like ours elicits a general cortical stress response after about only a half an hour of exposure and continues for at least an hour after exposure and maybe longer because that's when they ended the experiment. Now think about the problem with kids going to school. They're riding in this bus, they're sitting in the bus for maybe a half hour or more, the stress response is kicked in, it's caused some low grade inflammation of their cerebral cortex, they're not gonna be able to learn as well the minute they arrive at school 
And that process, process is going to go on probably for several hours. So when we talk about how committed we are to a good education for all of our children, and the legislature is always talking about a great education that not very much money can buy, but they don't think about what it's going to take for those kids to learn when they get there. Well, this is one of the problems that's going to prevent them from learning. Four-year-olds exposed to even modest levels of nitrogen oxide compounds from traffic pollution showed worse cognitive development and even greater deficits in motor development. These are four-year-old children. By comparison, there is a dose-correlated response or decrease in cognitive development amongst children exposed to secondhand smoke. How many of you have natural gas appliances in your home? You may want to ignore everything I'm about to say. Natural gas appliances give off nitrogen oxide compounds and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, multiple benzene ringed compounds, that uh, obviously are some of the key components of urban air pollution. Numerous studies from many different countries now have shown a correlation between natural gas appliances in use in the home and increases in respiratory diseases among family members, especially children. But another recent study found that preschool age children showed poor intellectual performance, worse memory, and shorter attention spans if they had grown up in homes with natural gas appliances and higher indoor levels of nitrogen oxide compounds. Supporting this study is one from researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health, where they found that children who lived in the same neighborhoods of Boston, these are all children who lived in Boston, but they uh, distinguished amongst the children by how much air pollution they were exposed to. And they found that when they controlled for other, or, or other factors like economics, smoking in the home, socioeconomic, all that kind of stuff. When they controlled for all that, they found that the children who grew up with more air pollution actually had lower IQs. And the impact was comparable to if the mother had smoked during her pregnancy or if they had uh, been exposed to toxic levels of lead. Next, I'd like to take you deeper under the microscope and explore what air pollution does at the cellular level, focusing on children and human embryos, and then put that into a broader context about what environmental contamination in general is doing to our children. Dr. Pope mentioned oxidative stress as the likely mechanism for cardiovascular diseases related to air pollution. It is also a common pathway for multiple chronic disease processes, including cancer. Oxidative stress could be defined <clears throat> We're cutting off oxidative capacity at the bottom there. Oxidative stress could be defined as an impaired balance between free radical production and antioxidant capacity resulting in excessive oxidative products. The generation of reactive oxygen species can cause oxidative damage to DNA, to proteins, or to lipids within the cells. You might consider oxidative stress as another term for being metabolically strangled. Not enough oxygen getting to the tissues to satisfy their metabolic needs. Oxidation is the process that turns iron into rust. So you might consider this oxidative stress, quote, as the rusting of your organs at the cellular level. A study published just a month ago involving 120 children showed that ambient concentrations of PM10 and PM2.5 had significant associations with urinary markers of oxidative stress in school children. Children exposed to high levels of PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, showed the same thing. But if they were exposed to both, there was a synergistic effect in terms of the amount of urinary markers of, ox of oxidative stress in the children. This study also suggested that the, the metals that are often attached to particulate matter had their own additional impact on the markers of oxidative stress. 
fine and ultrafine particulate matter exhibit numerous biological activities that are detrimental to cells. In addition to the oxidative stress that we talked about and the, de the depletion of intracellular uh, cell oxidants, they cause direct cytotoxicity, including mitochondrial dysfunction, altered phagocytic function, which is the scavenging system of the cell to get rid of impurities, bacteria, and things like that, altered cell signaling pathways, and cause direct DNA and lipid damage. Ultrafine particles, the stuff that's even smaller than PM2.5, actually can be worse and has been shown to not be membrane bound or bound to cell membranes. Therefore, ultrafine particulate matter can actually have direct access to cellular uh, entities like proteins, organelles, and DNA, which enhance its toxic potential. One result of this is that air pollution makes cells more vulnerable to bacterial invasion. And we've seen numerous studies that show an increased rate of respiratory infections, respiratory deaths in adults and children, pneumonia, sinus infections, and now we've seen three studies that show higher rates of appendicitis in circumstances where the air pollution is higher. Last fall, three American scientists received the Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, a little social commentary, wouldn't it be nice if Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greeter, and Jack Sostak were names that our children knew instead of Paris Hilton. How sad it is that they all know who's on American Idol, but none of them know about the American scientists that have won the Nobel Prize. What they won the Nobel Prize for is their work on telomeres. Telomeres are the little protective end caps on the ends of chromosomes, much like the ends of shoelaces that serve kind of the same function for chromosomes in that they wrap things up and protect them from unraveling and protect the chromosomes from actually becoming entangled with each other. Now, your shoelaces don't need to divide in order for you to stay healthy, but your chromosomes do. And your chromosomes dividing is dependent upon, dependent upon intact telomeres. During each round of cell division or DNA replication, a section of telomere is shaved off so that every time the cell divides, you lose a little bit of telomere length. Eventually, you lose enough of the telomere that the cell can no longer divide and therefore normal cells can only divide a certain limited number of times before they die. Telomere shortening then is both a cause of and a marker of cell age. And an enzyme called telomerase helps to maintain telomeres. Cancer cells are distinguished by being able to maintain telomerase activity and therefore telomere length and therefore the ability to keep dividing indefinitely. This is, explains why some organisms stay alive much longer than they should have. <laughs> That's Keith Richards in case any of you didn't grow up in the 60s. Um, Keith Richards must have some one heck of a process of telomerase. <laughs> People who are exposed occupationally to vehicle traffic show shorter telomere length, i.e. cell aging, equivalent to about 10 years compared to control groups who are not occupationally exposed to air pollution. Now, if you are 10 years older than you should be under the microscope, then all of your organs and your blood vessels are 10, year old, 10 years older as well and no amount of plastic surgery is going to change that. <laughs> Exposure to agents that are transmissible from mother to fetus has a profound influence on the function of many organ systems later in life, a concept called fetal origins of disease. By causing changes in gene expression, environmental insults can mislead 
early organ formation and predispose a baby to future diseases. Now a good example of this is the, is the result of some research done which showed that pregnant mothers exposed to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in air pollution. Uh, the researchers then drew, after the exposure, measured the air pollution exposure amongst the mothers. They then uh, drew blood from the mother from the umbilical cord at the time of birth, and they found that the concentrations of pollution that the mother was exposed to correlated with the amount of chemical alteration of the genes that are expressed in lung tissue. Five years later, those children that were born to mothers that were exposed to higher levels of air pollution and then showed higher levels of gene alteration had higher levels of asthma. In other words, the air pollution that the mother was exposed to affected the disease process in the child years later. Now there's been a great deal of national debate recently about the toxic assets that were leaving our children from the financial meltdown. There's a lot of national debate and discussion about the toxic environmental assets that we're leaving our children in terms of pollution, CO2 buildup and so forth. That's appropriate, it's not enough. But there is virtually no national discussion whatsoever about the toxic assets that are accumulating on the chromosomes of mankind. And it is here that air pollution in fact may have its biggest impact on public health. Even modest levels of air pollution associated, are associated with a multiplicity of adverse pregnancies outcomes, such as intrauterine growth retardation, including smaller head size, low birth weight, and premature birth. These are not outcomes that can be compensated for by feeding a baby more food once the baby is born. These are outcomes that are associated with lifelong propensities to a multiple multiplicity of adult diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, almost regardless of what you do to the baby after they're born. If those outcomes happen in the womb, they virtually guarantee changes and usually adverse changes in the health of that person lifelong. Another recent study has demonstrated that ambient levels of particulate matter and other pollutants generated by urban traffic pollution actually causes, cause changes in the morphology of the placenta. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted you to see this is on the right is a micrograph of, of rats that were exposed to PM 2.5, 27, on average 27.5 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, that's not even a red alert day here. The rats that were exposed to filtered air, much less PM 2.5 exposure, 6.5. And what they found under the microscope is that the placentas were markedly different. The volume of maternal blood, or the interface between the mother and the fetus, was much different if the mice were exposed to even modest levels of elevated PM 2.5. They also found some interesting things that on the fetal side, there were attempts anatomically to compensate for this, but they weren't enough. And the end result is that the overall size of, of the uh, mouse fetus at birth was reduced. But under the microscope, this is what air pollution does to the placenta. Now, the other interesting thing is the, these morphologic changes were found not just if the mouse was exposed during the pregnancy to the air pollution, but even if it preceded pregnancy. The impact wasn't as great, but it was still there, even if it preceded pregnancy. Researchers from the Columbia School of Public Health have been engaged in a multi-year project since 1998, 1998 examining the impact of air pollution on fetal chromosomes. They found that non-smoking pregnant women who carried personal air pollution monitors, at the time of birth, blood was drawn and examined for basically aberrations of chromosomes, and they found that those babies born to mothers who breathed more air pollution from different, city, different parts of New York City had actually 50% more chromosomal damage than mothers who were able to breathe cleaner air. The lead uh, author of this study, Dr. Frederick Pereira, 
said the embryo is many times more susceptible to DNA damage than an adult. These results raise serious concern. Cancer is a disease of accumulated genetic damage. Fetal susceptibility to DNA damage from air pollution has important implications for cancer risk and other developmental problems. The one clinical manifestation of this may be several studies that have shown higher incidence of childhood leukemia near sources of pollution such as freeways. Recent animal histologic data and epidemiologic data from Southern California suggest that air pollution increases the risk of brain cancer and possibly interferes with the function of tumor suppressor genes. Eventually, these DNA aberrations can actually be passed on to subsequent generations such that the air pollution that your children breathe today can affect the lifelong health of your great-grandchildren. This same group of researchers published a study last July where they found that five-year-old children whose mothers during the pregnancy had been exposed to air pollution and they divided them into two groups. Those mothers that were exposed to 2.26 nanograms, that is a very tiny amount of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, part of the air pollution mix that we're all exposed to. And this photograph is over, over bountiful on a typical winter day. Those mothers who were exposed to that modest level of air pollution, five years later, those children had lower IQs of about five points. Now I can guarantee you that on probably most days out of the year, the PAHs are higher than that along Bountiful, and I would bet that they might very well be in Utah County as well. Environmental factors, including chemical contaminants in air pollution, considered HAPs or hazardous air pollutants, are now known to be capable of altering gene expression, which is rapidly changing the environmental landscape and what we know about the effect of contamination on public health. Uh, if you take the level of, of, if you want to measure a pregnant woman's level of lead exposure uh, in the previous week, you would measure it from her blood. But if you want to know what she was exposed to in terms of lead 10 years ago, you measure it from her bones because lead mimics calcium and then gravitates to the bones. Researchers found that healthy mothers at the time of birth, if they measured the amount of lead in her bones and compare it with the amount of epigenetic changes in the white blood cells taken from her umbilical cord at birth, showed that the lead she was exposed to years ago, maybe even decades ago, correlated with the amount of epigenetic abnormalities at the time of her delivery. And what that means is, the lead exposure of the mother maybe decades ago can have a profound influence on the intellectual capacity and other disease processes of her children. This is just one example of how a woman's short-term exposure to low-level toxicants can affect the health of multiple generations and the relevant exposure can precede conception. When am I supposed to quit? Uh, sometime soon. Soon? Like if you had enough? Or has anybody I haven't offended yet? What this means is we are what our grandparents inhaled. And the corollary to that is our grandchildren will be what we inhaled. And so it's hard to overstate what kind of an impact the air pollution and other avenues of environmental contamination may have on public health. Uh, we know it's not good, but it may be enormous. I'm going to skip a few slides here because we're out of time. But I'm just going to say this one thing in the end. I want you to... <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry about that. This, this is Steve Jobs' latest worthless toy. Um, uh, it's, okay, I got, I got to tell you this. Okay, just to show you how important very tiny concentrations of chemicals can be. Um, if you have a TV, you probably are under the impression that Cialis deficiency is the largest plague of mankind in the history of the universe. Um, I tend to disagree with that, but you know, I do believe most of what I hear on TV. 
Um, Cialis is therapeutically effective at 30 parts per billion, one dose. Paxil, the most pop popular anti-anxiety drug, is effective at 30 parts per billion, and of course you have to take that if you run out of Cialis. <laughs> Albuterol is the most popular inhaler, or respiratory inhaler, which you have to take if the Cialis actually worked. And it is effective at 2.1 parts per billion. The most common used drug for birth control is effective at 35 parts per trillion, which hopefully you took before you took the Cialis. Now remember, some people can have profound life-threatening complications at these very tiny concentrations. It doesn't take much environmental contamination to have a profound effect on a fetus, and we're just learning how profound that effect can be. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna shorten the last 10 minutes of my talk to about one sentence. Remember the slogan painted on the factory walls by those Chinese rioters, give us back our green hills our clean air, our fresh water. Give us justice. We want to live. What will our children say about us when they learn what pollution has done to their future? Thank you.